What a great way to begin worship and being mindful of, of the glory and majesty of the God with whom we come to worship today. I want to welcome you to First United Methodist Church Midlothian. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston. This is Pastor April Failer. Uh, we look forward to joining you in, for worship today. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, we're so grateful you're with us today. Uh, today's a special day and that we're celebrating communion. And so if you're online, we would encourage you to grab some bread and, and some uh, juice and, and to get ready for that in our service. Uh, we have an opportunity today. Uh, you'll notice that things will, will be a, a little bit different. We're introducing some things that haven't been a part of our worship for a while, uh, one of them being the offering. So we're going to pass the plates uh, in the service, so just be ready for that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. A gear up. I was like, oh, no. Uh, uh, so if you already put your gift in these plates, that's just fine. Whoa, here we go. All right. <clears throat> Let me gear up the voice here. All right. So uh, if, if you uh, have already put your, pl your gifts in the plates, that's okay. Uh, but we're going to be bringing that back in worship but just because we want to be reminded that our giving is an expression of our worship. Uh, it's not something we do in addition to our worship. It's a part of who we are. Um, and so we'll be doing that. I will always leave the plates over here if you feel more comfortable giving that way. You're certainly welcome to do that. Um, but we have an, a great opportunity to come uh, to, before the Lord today, not only to hear the word, not only to pray together as a church, not only to come to share in the table and the beauty of the table of this Jesus who invites us to draw near to him, um, but we have the chance just to come and lift our praises to God. And so uh, we're grateful for these opportunities I want us to begin our, our worship with just this thought. It comes from Richard Foster, uh, and it's just a great way to center our worship and, and to help us be reminded of why it's so important for us to come before God together as the church. We live in a day where a lot of people question the need to gather together as Christians, and yet that is never, ever questioned in Scripture. There's power when the people of God come together, and let's hear these words from Richard Foster. Worship is our response to the overtures of love from the heart of the Father. Its central reality is found in spirit and truth. It is kindled within us only when the Spirit of God touches our human spirit. And so that is our prayer as we enter this time of worship, that the Spirit of God would touch our spirits that the heart, the love of the Father, the overtures of his love for us would be at the forefront of our hearts and minds as we sing, as we pray, as we listen, and as we respond. May it be so. Morning, church. Let's stand and sing. Victory in Jesus. I heard it all.
this time we're going to dismiss our children for godly play. affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time I invite our ushers to please come forward and, and let us bow in prayer together. 
Almighty God, we know it was you who first moved toward us. We know that we love, but we only love because you were the first one to love us. And that Jesus, you gave yourself to us as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And we know that anything that we give to you is just a response to you having first given to us, of you having first loved us. And so let our response be our worship, our acknowledgement of what you've done, that you've done for us, and let it be our praise to you. We pray this in the beautiful and wonderful name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. stand. Let us pray. Great God in heaven, we know that all we have is yours. We know that the love that we give started with you first. The hope that we have started with you first. The way we love others started with you first. Lord, it's during this time that, that we are in many ways grasping to your hope. We know there are, are many wonderful things to celebrate, not only inside this church, but outside this church. And I pray your presence is still always available and always accessible at all times, not just for us, but for our greater community, for our state, for our nation, and for those beyond the American walls. As the fight continues between Ukraine and Russia, we are losing people right and left as the death tolls rise. We are a called people to pay attention because we know that it's, it's 
It's not just us that matters. It's all of humankind that matters. Be with the people of Ukraine. And lead us all humankind together into a world of peace and light through the transforming presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen the foundation of the churches that are in both places, both trying to hang on to hope, both trying to express your presence in the midst of violence. Strengthen their foundations so that they can stand strong in the midst of war. That they can find some way to, to lead their communities into a place of hope, knowing that your presence is always accessible. Make your presence known in the battlefield. Remind them all, including us, that there is always a way to peace through the love of Jesus Christ. Encourage these churches so that they can maintain their strength even in the midst of people who are fearing for their lives. Allow them to know the warmth of your hope. Allow them to see the light and the darkness your strength and the weakness and your, the presence when there is fear. Let us stand united in that prayer for peace and the encouragement that we not only need here as a church, but that they need there in Russia and in the Ukraine. And though they are at the forefronts of a battle, so are we. Lord, there are so many ways that we can serve you, and, and finding ways to, to do that has been something that we've been called to do as disciples. We also know that being disciples, we face challenges. That our transformation into disciples and our love that's coming from you will go out but we do get off course. We can get caught up in our own stuff that we, we lose track of where you're standing. Give us the strength to find you and to focus our eyes on you and your will first. Because even the original disciples had trouble staying on course and we are very similar to them. Jesus taught them a prayer to pray to keep them in the place where they can see God. And they can know hope. And they can continue to be the hands and feet of Christ that we are all called to be. Sometimes it's just in a prayer that we can start looking for peace and hope. It's in this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, well, welcome to the first Sunday of Lent. We kicked off our sermon series 
last week, just to get kind of ahead of Lent, that Lent began on Ash Wednesday of this week. And so we are in this first Sunday. And to be reminded, um, Sundays in the season of Lent, though it is a season of introspection, a season of examining the heart, a season where it's kind of that courageous work of looking inwardly at who we are and asking God to revitalize our spirit and renew us inwardly. Um, We know that Sundays are a celebration, right? Uh, Sundays are a leaving behind of the things that we give up and kind of that uh, the, the more, I guess, difficult work of Lent. And it's like a little Easter and that we remember that we are people of a risen Lord in Jesus Christ. And so uh, what a joy it is to be here in that. Um, our, our focus this Lent, we went over last week and introduced and carried through as well on Ash Wednesday. Uh, the, the focus for Lent is to develop our prayer lives not only as individuals in the church, but also collectively as the body of Christ. That we want to grow our prayer life, both for you in your own practice and what you do apart from this place, but also to be intentional about our prayer life together as the church, to have opportunities to come together as God's people, to grow in our calling out to God, our praying to God on behalf of others and for ourselves. And so that's our focus this Lent. Now, I say prayer life knowing that Dallas Willard, whom I I love and whose name I bring up way too often in worship, um, I know that he would correct me, and I I listen to his words. Um, Dallas Willard says we shouldn't talk about it as our prayer life because prayer life assumes that prayer is just a component of our life that it's something that we do and can leave behind, that prayer becomes a box that you can check that you did it that morning and you don't have to pray anymore because you already prayed. Uh, And he says, no, we don't develop a prayer life, we develop a praying life. And the difference is, is that we carry an attitude of prayer throughout our life everywhere that we go that we carry with us a spirit and a desire to fellowship with God, that we might be in the car, we might be in the workplace or in school, that, that prayer is a part of who we are and we're not limited to just the devotional time that we have. Prayer becomes a, a desire that, that just radiates out of our life. And so really and truly we're hoping to develop a, a praying life for you individually and for us as a church. And so I hope you're, you're participating in that. We have our first prayer service coming up on Wednesday. would love for you to be a part of that. Uh, we're going to look a little bit more in prayer over the sermons in this series. And today, our scriptures that we're going to be referring to are from Psalm 1 and John 15. So a little bit of Bible exercise if we turn there. Um, I'll have to say, I, I just don't know we have the time to get into John 15. Um, I did have Starbucks this morning, so there's a shot, you know, like there's a chance, you know, but, but I'm not sure we're going to quite get there. But we're going to be looking at Psalm 1 and, and some glimpses into John 15. Um, but before we get there, I want to just share some of my experience as a pastor and talking to people that I've served in regards to their prayer life or praying life. Um, oftentimes I've had people come to me and just share some concerns about their own questions regarding prayer. I've had people come to me and say, well, I, I just don't know what to pray about. Like I give God thanks for things and maybe I stop there or maybe I pray for the needs, but I don't know what more I should be praying about. Or, or people come and they say, I don't really know how to pray. I don't know if I'm praying in a way that's, that's right, if it's what God really wants me to be praying, how he wants me to be praying. There are people who come and say, well, I don't really know the will of God for my life, so I don't know how to pray specifically for that. Or I don't know if my prayers are really working, if something's really happening when I pray. I don't sense the presence of God. And I don't feel like there's really power behind my praying. And chances are, at some point in your journey, and maybe even right now, you've you've got some of those same questions. And, And so in this series, and even today, we're going to take a look at at this and address some of these concerns. And today, specifically, we're going to look at how the Word of God can bring clarity, understanding, and power to our praying. But we're going to begin 
with a premise that I want us to hold on to. Uh, This is an essential one for us, and and if you don't hear anything else I say today, listen to this. Um, You cannot have a deep praying life without having an equally deep life in the Word. That earned, by my count, at least four amens. That's... (laughs) If I had a microphone I could drop, I would do it, and we'd end today. No, that's pretty good for Methodists. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Like, you, you can't have a deep praying life uh, without having an equally deep life in the Word. And, and I'm going to play this out a little bit for us to understand. And, and we're not going to have to go very deep theologically in regards to the Bible and what it is to see this. You see, the Bible is the means by which God is revealed to us. We know God. Man, I'm on a roll today. All right. Uh, I've got another one. Let's just keep this going. But uh, you know, the, the Bible, like we can know God through the word, and we can only know who God is through the word. It is the word of God that reveals the heart of God the desires of God, the will of God, both for creation and for our lives. It is the word that reveals the activity of God. You see, it's it's important for us to understand this. This is not a deep and complicated issue, but it is the word of God that reveals God. Apart from, apart from the word of God, we would be left to assume who God is. And imagine for a moment what that does to your praying when you have to make assumptions about who God is. You see, it's the word of God that allows us to know God. Therefore, it is the word of God that is to give shape to our praying. It is the Word of God that that should inform what we pray about, how we pray, what it looks like for us to pray. You, You take the same principle and apply it to any relationship. The more you come to know of a person, the easier it is to communicate the easier it is to connect with somebody, the easier it is to talk to them, the easier it is to move beyond the how's, how's the weather and those, those darn cowboys, you know. Um, like you can move beyond that stuff and get to the deeper stuff. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. The Word of God helps us to get beyond the, the lack of clarity and the not knowing to know the Lord more deeply. And so it is our knowledge of God that becomes a direct reflection of our prayer life, and it's reflected in our prayer life. And for some of us, the reason we struggle with clarity and understanding how to pray or what to pray about is that we're not confident in how much we know God. And so for us, the first step in deepening our prayer life and and getting a grasp on what it is we're to pray about, it's to seek a greater knowledge of who God is. That once we come to know more clearly the heart of God, God's will and desire for us, the character of God, the way that God is alive in the midst of our lives, what he, his hopes are for, for you and for me. Once we come to get a better grasp on those things, then we know how to approach the throne of grace and to call upon him. So if you don't hear anything else in the sermon, it's a good thing it was at the beginning. You, you can't have a deep praying life without having an equally deep life in the Word. And if that first part resonated with you of the questions about your prayer life and the power and clarity and understanding, then maybe the first place to look is how is my relationship with God through the Word? Am I growing in what I know of God and what God desires for me? It's maybe the first place to look. That's how important the word is 
in our praying. But now that we've kind of established that, I think the question is, um, how can the word bring power to our praying? How can the word then bring clarity to our praying? And so let's spend a little bit bit of time fleshing this out. Uh, I first want us to consider that it's not just that we read the Bible that matters. It's how we read it. And this isn't to make it more complicated for us. But it's not just that we read the Bible, that we check the box that matters. It's how we read it. And let me illustrate. Now, for many of us who, who participate regularly, or at least somewhat regularly, maybe even infrequently with, with the devotional practices, our devotions look something like this. We come before God, and maybe we begin with prayer, maybe we don't. But we open the Bible, and we read a passage. And since most devotionals have a commentary, we then read the commentary. And the commentary might consist of helping us understand the Bible passage more, or it's just an ooey-gooey story that makes us feel good. All devotionals are different. (laughs) And then we pray, and then boom, we're out the door. Uh, Or boom, we fall asleep, whether you do yours in the morning or the evening. But I wonder how often you have done this And just an hour later, for the life of you, you can't remember what you read. None of you. That's great. Well, good. We can move on past this part. I didn't see any hands raised or no amens to that one. But I'm just just going to assume, all right, that, that that has happened to you at a certain point in your life. That you have read, you prayed, you read the you know, content of the devotional, and then man, for just a little bit later, you can't even remember what you read. And you're thinking like, mm, maybe it was in the Old Testament? You know, like, I don't, I don't know what I read. Um, that happens to us. And if that's ever happened to you or happens to you on a regular basis, It shows us that something is missing when it comes to our engaging the Word of God, especially in a way that that develops our praying. And and to understand this a little bit better, I want us to turn to Psalm 1, because Psalm 1 is going to show us where, well, maybe there's some deficiency in where and how we're reading the Word. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3 say this. They say, Blessed is the one who does not walk in in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. So the psalmist says uh, that, that the person is blessed who delights in the law of the Lord, meaning the entirety of scripture is what the psalmist is pointing to here, who delights in it and who meditates on it day and night. And for some of us, this is the part that's missing. It's the meditation. And it's important at this point that we define meditation because that word likely brings up a number of different images for us. You know, there's two different kinds of meditation. There is what we call the transcendental meditation. And this is for us kind of the image of like the Buddhist monk, right? Uh, who sits in, in meditation, and they often repeat a word or a phrase, you the om, um, and they do this um, because the purpose of transcendental meditation is to empty the mind of thought and to empty the heart of desires. So they repeat a, 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 a sound in order to empty the mind and empty the heart. Now, this is just the opposite of the idea of biblical meditation. 
the idea of biblical meditation isn't that you empty the mind and empty the heart. It's that you engage the mind and engage the heart. It isn't an emptying of being. It's an embracing and an acknowledgement and a, a dwelling upon in consideration of our being. You see, when we meditate over Scripture, when the psalmist says, he, blessed is the one who meditates day and night, he's saying blessed is a person who wrestles with Scripture. Blessed is a person who considers it beyond the time that they read it. Blessed is a person who begins to think about not only the meaning of the Scripture, what it means for all of us, in the intent of why the author wrote this and why God had this exist for us in Scripture, but who also considers what it means for their life. You see, this is the purpose of biblical meditation. It's to engage the mind of saying, what does it mean? What is God saying to us, to everyone, through this passage? And then ultimately to engage the heart. What is God saying for me and my life? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to me through this word? You see, this is the idea of biblical meditation. Uh, Meditation in the biblical context is going to do a couple things for us. The first is that biblical meditation will provide room for internalization of Scripture. And this is a really critical move. What happens in internalization is that the words jump from the page and into our life. Where they're no longer static words on a page, they become something that becomes a part of us that we begin to consider and dwell upon and wrestle with. And it becomes an almost relationship and something that we think about as the psalmist says day and night throughout our life, throughout our coming and our going. Now, this is a rigorous engagement of the mind and the heart at this level. That's what internalization is. I like to think of internalization kind of like marinating fajita meat. Uh, and that's just because, like, most of my illustrations have to do with food. I think about that all the time. But, but, but you know, when you're, you're marinating, you know, you know chicken meat, um, you let it sit overnight, right? Like, you don't just dab it in there and then put it on the grill. If you do, then, like, I'm not going to eat with you, you know? Like, you, <laughs> like you make the marinade, and then you just, like, you let it sit in there because you want the juices to, to soak into the meat, and it takes some time because... You know, chicken's a little dense, and, well, sometimes we're a little, you know, dense. It takes some time to sit with the Scriptures and for it to, to consider and to come into our life. You know, those ahas, those insights, even by the Spirit, don't always come just in a moment when we read Scripture. And to sit and dwell and consider something allows time for the Word to seep in to the parts of who we are into our being. And this is really powerful to think about because in the ancient world, you have to consider what they thought about when the way that they engaged Scripture. They didn't have Bibles to carry around. They didn't have a Bible app on their phone. They listened to the Word of God, and they about had to memorize it. They had to take an image or a phrase or the passage itself, and they had to remember, they had to engage the mind to say, what does this mean? And for them to think about it day and night didn't mean they had it in front of us to refer back to. They had to internalize it. And this is so important because this is when we give, through the internalization and the wrestling with the word, this is when we give the Holy Spirit room to move. And to make this word a word for us in our life. To not only consider the intent of what it means for all of us, but to consider how the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in light of your circumstances. This happens when we give time for internalization. 
And this step of internalization is so important because it leads to the second thing that's most important about meditation. Uh, It's internalization that leads to transformation. Once we have internalized and wrestled with the word and considered what the Holy Spirit is drawing out for us in our life, that's when the Holy Spirit also begins to transform us. That's when the word changes us inwardly. Jesus refers to this in John 15 with a beautiful image. Jesus says to his disciples that they will remain in him if his words remain in them. Think about that for a moment. John 15, Jesus is about to leave his disciples. He's been physically with them for three years. He's about to leave them. And yet Jesus reserves the most intimate of of relational words for that moment. Jesus says, you will know me even more and in a way you never have, even when I'm absent from you, if my words remain in you. And the idea of remaining, abiding, is that they become one with you. You hear that? Like if my words become something you wrestle with and something you treasure, that they become a part of who you are and your value and your characters. Man, that's when I'm present with you. That's when I'm going to be at work in you. I mean, that's powerful. Jesus says that's when the word will bear fruit in your life. If I'm in you and my words are in you. And Jesus uses the same image for this idea of transformation and the idea of intimacy that leads to fruit that the psalmist does in Psalm 1. Jesus says um, you'll bear fruit if you are like a branch that's attached to the vine. If you're connected to the source of life, just like a tree that's planted near water with a source of life there and ready, it can bear fruit in its season. And everything that it does will prosper. You see, when you've internalized the word and considered how the Holy Spirit is making this word a word for your life, and you've let it begin to shape the way you think and your character that's when God will begin to bring new fruit in your life. Because here's the thing about fruit in Scripture. We tend to think of fruit in the terms of what we do, but most often in Scripture, when it talks about transformation, it is an inward transformation of our spirit, of our nature. It's a development of character, of kind of like Paul says in Galatians. The fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. This is the way God bears fruit because the doing flows out of our being. And God will seek to transform our nature and our spirit first. Then the doing will change. This happens when we meditate on the word, when we engage the word, when we internalize it, when we allow it to change us. God, in his grace through it, To change us. You see, when you do this, the Word will teach you how to pray. When you wrestle with the Word, and you say, God, what does this mean for my life? What are you saying to me? You begin to sense something powerful beginning to emerge. You begin to pray. Your prayers are aimed around where God is moving in your heart and in your life and the truth and reality of what the word is holding in front of us. Like when you do this, the word will teach you how to pray. And if you want clarity and understanding and power to come and be a part of your prayer life, then you let the Word teach you how to pray. You let the Spirit through the Word teach you how to pray. This is how we come to understand and develop a deeper prayer life is through the Word. In this season of Lent, if you've been practicing our waypoints this week, then you've gathered a sense of, of what we're doing in the waypoints. And it's precisely this. We're taking the book of Psalms, a book that teaches us how to pray, the prayer book of the Bible. And we're going to tell you what the psalm means, and then we're going to try and lead us to pray through the psalm. To take a passage in the Bible 
and to build prayer around the will and the heart of God for us. We invite you to participate in the waypoints that are found on our, on our webpage under media. We're going to look through the book of Psalms in Lent to let the word of God teach us how to pray, to shape what we pray about and how we pray, and to bring power to our praying. And I'm going to model this with Psalm 1 right here and now as we get ready for communion. So let's bow together. Father, we come to you as your children. We come to you, each and every one of us, desiring to live a life that honors you. We don't want a life that keeps in step and rhythm with those who do not know you, who might be wicked and don't consider your ways. God, we want to be the people who live in the midst of your blessings. Who live lives that bless you. That point to your kingdom. God, we want a heart that that delights in your word. Because we know the value of your word. Because we know you through the word, that the path to a deeper life with you comes through knowing you as you are revealed in your word. And as your spirit takes the word and speaks truth and teaches us all things, as Jesus says in John 15, give us a heart to love your word, that it's not a chore or a box for us to check off. There is a desire to be drawn to your word. And let it bless our lives, the word bless our lives as we meditate on it throughout our life. Not considering it for moments that we give for devotion, but considering it as we move about our day, engaging it in the workplace and in our hobbies, in our home, in our school, everywhere we find ourselves. Let us have a a, a wrestling match with your word to consider what does it mean for our life? God, what do you have for us in this? Because we want your word to bear fruit in us. We want to be like a tree that's planted by water that's continually nurtured by the beauty and wonder of your word. That you would meet us in it and enrich our life, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of your kingdom and the sake of all those around us. We want what we do to prosper because we love you and we love your kingdom. We pray you bring fruit as we come before your word this day that you might meet us and change us through and through. God, we are grateful for this opportunity to come before your table. We know, Jesus, that you have invited us to come and draw near to you. And then in coming to this table to receive the sacrifice of your body and your blood, We're told to be mindful of our brokenness and need for grace. And the entire Lenten season is aimed at our being aware and examining the heart and our need, being honest with who we are, our brokenness, and that we bring that to you for healing. And it is your heart, as as told to us in the scriptures, that desires to forgive and bring healing. And so we have no fear in coming to this place of judgment if we bring our brokenness and lay it at your feet. God, it is you who will breathe new life and healing into us. And so we come confessing our sins, acknowledging our need for grace and your ever-present invitation to come to find rest and healing in your presence. We are thankful for this table and the power of the love of Christ which it represents. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get ready to come to the table, we remember that on the night before he was given up for us, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you broken on your behalf. Take and eat. It's my gift to you. On that same night, he took the cup and after blessing it, said, this is a cup of a new covenant. 
that I'm redefining what it means to be in relationship with God, that no longer is your relationship based on your own efforts and your own doing to accomplish a righteousness that is simply impossible for you. Instead, it is my blood shed for you that in receiving the gift of all that I've done, you're welcome back into family and that I can be one with you and you with me. We come to the table to celebrate the work of Christ and all that Christ has done on our behalf. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon these resources. They would be for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we come here to meet him, we may sense his work in the midst of our lives. This is our prayer that we pray to the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask that those who are assisting with communion would come forward. choir is going to come up and sing for us uh, as you are taking communion. We have ushers that are going to guide you kind of row by row, so don't just hop up because you see people coming. Uh, they'll, they'll allow you to, to kind of move so that we want there to be time uh, for you to, to meet with God at the altar and for this to be a place to pray. Uh, if you can't find a place to kneel, you can stand. If you can't kneel, you can stand just around the altar. This is a place for us to come to bring our hearts and our desires before God. And so use this time to meet with the Lord in the midst of this. Um, if you would like to make a gift, our bishop asked for us uh, as a church to take up an offering for the refugees and the orphans in Ukraine. So if you would like to bring a gift, you can put it at the altar. Everything you put at the altar will be given uh, for that specific offering. We will be serving on the outside of the aisle. So if you'll come that direction, you can make your way back to your seat through the inside aisle.
I want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, just a, a couple of reminders. Uh, we have a, wor a worship time tonight for those who are part of our discipleship groups. Uh, so we'll have a meal, a little bit of worship, and kind of vision casting for this uh, new season for us. If you're interested in being a part of small group ministry, then um, come on tonight. We'd love to have you. And, and we'll get introduced to a little bit of, of that life together. Uh, we also have a work week end coming up. At the end of March, I know y'all, this group looks like you're ready to get your hands dirty. Uh, we're going to clear out this. If you see the house is demoed, we're going to kind of clear up some of that land a little bit and take some first steps in doing that. So we'd love to have your help uh, that day. Um, we also have a part of our praying this Lent um, is that we have an opportunity to pray at, on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We're going to have a prayer service. I'd love for you to be a part of that. And, and come and join us. We'll just be gathering together and we'll be guiding you through a time of prayer together as a church. We also have a prayer card where we're praying a specific prayer for our church every day of the week. So Don's got some in the back. If you don't have some, we have some up here as well. We'd love to hand you one and, and have you join us praying every day for this. Um, but what a great time it is to come together as a church in this and to truly seek and pursue the Lord in our praying. Let's stand for the benediction. May we, uh, like the church in Acts 2, be devoted to the word of God and devoted to prayer, knowing that as we seek God through the word, as we meditate and consider, that, that it is through this that the Holy Spirit brings transformation into us and guides us into a deeper praying life. May we do in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.